Hi, I wanted to do some videos of uh, some of the passages that we go over in class. This is something that we went over in class, but you might not have been here. It's the first meeting of Anne and Wentworth um, after they have, uh, after seven years or eight years they've been apart. So this is in chapter seven. It's on pages 41 and 42 of your book. Anne is staying with her sister um, at the Musgrave Cottage. She learns she's about to see Wentworth again for the first time. Um, and the narrative is going to give her impression of the scene. Uh, it's got this slow motion effect, kind of like uh, the example I use in class is when you get in a, in a car crash in an auto accident and the car spins around or does something like that. You can describe what the car did, but what it felt like is this totally different thing. It's this slow motion effect. And that's the effect we're going to get in this particular scene. So in class, I use this introduction. Um, it's a professor, John Mullen from England, who uh, has written on Jane Austen, and uh, he's going to introduce this scene and talk about it. So uh, let's watch his little introduction here. We're going to go to the first reading now. Now, I'll just say quickly what it is and, and, why, and why I've chosen it. Eleanor's going to do most of it. Um, it's from Persuasion, and it's in Persuasion, as some of you all know, Anne Elliot, uh, who's 28 and lost her bloom. Uh, has, eight years before the novel begins, been persuaded by her friend and mother substitute, her own mother being dead, her friend and mother substitute, Lady Russell, to turn down the proposal of marriage from Captain Frederick Wentworth, even though she loves him and he loves her. And she's persuaded to do this because she's convinced not only that it would be foolish for her to rush into it, but that actually it would be bad for him, for his career, which is at that moment non-existent in the Navy. And he is sorely offended and goes off. But then he comes back. Eight years later, Anne is staying with her sister Mary and Mary's husband, her brother-in-law, Charles. And Captain Wentworth is visiting and he's at the Musgrove's house and she knows that he's there and she hears that he's going to come down he's going out shooting with charles and henrietta and louisa the fluffy girls and he's coming down and she's about to see him and it's been eight years and i and i chose this because well i'll tell you afterwards <laughs> <laughs> okay so now we're going to get um we're going to get this actress is going to go through this uh, this reading. So let's let her give this particular part of the passage. Mary, very much gratified by Captain Wentworth's attention, was delighted to receive him. While a thousand feelings rushed on Anne, of which this was the most consoling, that it would soon be over. And it was soon over. In two minutes after Charles's preparation, the others appeared. They were in the drawing room. Her eye half met Captain Wentworth's. A bow, a curtsy passed. She heard his voice. He talked to Mary, said all that was right, said something to the Miss Musgroves, enough to mark an easy footing. The room seemed full, full of persons and, and voices. But a few minutes ended it. Charles showed himself at the window. All was ready. Their visitor had bowed and was gone. The Miss Musgroves were gone too, suddenly resolving to walk to the end of the village with the sportsman. The room was cleared, and Anne might finish her breakfast as she could. It is over. It is over, she repeated again and again, in nervous gratitude. The worst is over. So I'm going to pause here and look at this particular passage, um, looking at it a little more closely. So one of the things that makes this uh, this passage work, giving this sort of indistinct notion of time suspended, is the way Austin is deliberately playing with time signatures in this piece of narrative. So I've highlighted here that it starts at the end. It would soon be over, and it was soon over. In two minutes after the others, and then we have a few minutes ended it, and then we have their visitor had bowed and was gone. So by the time we end it, it's, um, it's already a finished thing. Um, and then she ends up saying it's over. And so this repetition of it being over allows this kind of uh, 
indistinct time signature so that we rather than a straightforward narrative of what happened we have this bunch of impressions and within that then you have this language that's very indistinct we have a thousand feelings rushed on Anne we have a bunch of stuff in passive voice the others appeared her eye half met Captain Wentworth nothing happens that much. A bow, a curtsy pass. Notice it doesn't say he bowed and she curtsied. It doesn't have something direct like that. A bow, a curtsy passed. It doesn't have somebody who did it. She heard his voice and it says he said all that was right, said something to the Miss Musgroves. There's no reported dialogue here. She doesn't really see him. She half sees him. The room seemed full, full of persons and voices. If you count, there's six people in the room. There's Captain Wentworth, there's the two Miss Musgroves, there's Charles, there's Anne, and there's Mary. So which is full enough for a breakfast room in a cottage, but it seems almost as if there's this weird crowd there. The indistinct nature of the things she says here mean that we don't have a definite impress we don't have a definite sense of what's going on, but we do have a the impression that, that Anne gets from it. Um, this final sentence of, of the paragraph here uh, to me is, is masterful. Notice how much stuff happens all in one sentence. It kind of sweeps everybody out. Charles showed himself at the window, so he comes back around to say, come on out. All was ready. Their visitor had bowed and was gone, had bowed and was gone, so he's already gone. The Miss Musgroves were gone too, suddenly resolving to walk to the end of the village. A little bit of a joke there, because obviously, obviously they want to tag along with Captain... Uh, with Captain Wentworth. The room was cleared. Anne might finish her breakfast as she could. If you look at that sentence, it's one sentence. And it sweeps everybody out and leaves her there to deal with what just happened. Um, that's very deliberate. So um, we're going to see Anne, uh, Jane Austen construct sentences like this again. Um, you notice how much this sort of has happened to Anne. She's got these impressions. There's nobody has done anything. It all was done. It happened. Um, so then let's look at the aftermath as she thinks this through. Mary talked, but she could not attend. She had seen him. They had met. They had once more been in the same room. Soon, however, she began to reason with herself and tried to be feeling less. Eight years, almost eight years had passed since all had been given up. How absurd to be resuming the agitation which such an interval had banished into distance and indistinctness. What might not eight years do? Events of every description, changes, alienations, removals all, all must be comprised in it, and oblivion of the past, how natural, how certain too. It included nearly a third part of her own life. Alas, with all her reasoning, she found that to retentive feelings, eight years, maybe little more than nothing. Now, how were his sentiments to be read? Was this like wishing to avoid her? And the next moment she was hating herself for the folly which asked the question. On one other question, which perhaps her utmost wisdom might not have prevented, she was soon spared all suspense, for after the Miss Musgroves had returned and finished their visit at the cottage, she had this spontaneous information from Mary. Captain Wentworth is not very gallant by you, Anne, though he was so attentive to me. <laughs> Henrietta asked him what he thought of you when they went away, and he said, you were so altered that he should not have known you again. <laughs> Mary had no feelings to make her respect to her sisters in a common way, but she was perfectly unsuspicious of being inflicting any peculiar wound. Altered beyond his knowledge, Anne fully submitted in silent, deep mortification. Doubtless it was so, and she could take no revenge, for he was not altered, or not for the worse. She had already acknowledged it to herself, and she could not think differently. Let, he, let him think of her as he would. No! The years which had destroyed her youth and bloom had only given him a more glowing, manly, open look and no respect lessening his personal advantages. She had seen the same Frederick Wentworth. 
so altered that he should not have known her again. Oh, these were the words which could not but dwell with her. Yet soon she began to rejoice that she had heard them. They were of sobering tendency. They allayed agitation, they composed, and they consequently must make her happier. <laughs> Okay, so what's being narrated here is her own process of trying to deal with the agitation she just went through. So um, it starts out here. You, you can see all these markers that I've put in red here are little hints of the way she's thinking to herself. They're reasoning with herself. How absurd. What might not eight years do? It obviously doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, all must be comprised in how natural, how certain. She's convincing herself that you know, it really doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, and then she, but she then realizes, well, she still does love him. And then she returns to him, him when it says now, um, to me, that's, that's one of those hints that we're in free and direct discourse. It's like, that's the way she says, she's saying that to herself. Okay, let's see, how does he feel? Was this like wishing to avoid her? And then she realizes, oh, that's foolish. It's fool foolish to ask a question like this. Then you get the introduction of what Mary says that, you know, he said uh, he was so altered that he should not have known you again, which of course is just, uh, <laughs> it's the kind of thing Mary would just go right ahead and say. Um, and fully submitted and, and doubtless. The, these words again are words she's of talking to herself. It's not the narrator saying doubtless, it's Anne saying doubtless. She's kind of convincing herself. The idea that the years had destroyed her youth and bloom is really harsh, but it's her own harshness on herself, um, whereas he has this more glowing, manly, open look. Um, again, the narration itself, uh, we talked about free and direct discourse, is taking on these things. Um, we're going to let um, Professor Mullen talk about uh, how it must make her happier. He's going to talk about that a little bit at the end there, so I'll leave the last word to him. Thanks very much. So, well, I hope you heard in that brilliantly rendered last line, must make her happier. Um, the two things which are kind of quite common in Jane Austen, but which I think are especially illustrated in this passage, which is, first of all, that um, despite what uh, Emily Bronze's sister Charlotte said about Jane Austen, Jane Austen did do feeling she was interested in feeling, and Persuasion, the last of her novels, the most autumnal, is about sort of strangulated passion. Um, but also, and I hope you won't mind me being sort of uh, a little bit uh, sort of academic or dusty about this, that's no virtue in itself if it weren't for the second fact, which is her incredible technical audacity. Because the thing about Jane Austen is that... She wasn't just an elegant writer and a funny writer. She was also technically and formally one of the most experimental novelists in the history of English literature. And lots of the later novelists, from Henry James to Nabokov, who condescended to her later, nicked all her techniques, actually. And the technique you heard in this piece, which was one she invented, she invented it at a parlour table in Hampshire. She invented it without knowing any other writers or belonging to literary circles or even having clever and interesting siblings who were writing novels as well. <laughs> she just invented it on her own. And, and, and it's called free and direct style. And it's the most and sort of important invention in the history of the novel, actually, because it's the means by which, as, as you heard Eleanor brilliantly do, Jane Austen appears to tell you a story and yet lets the feelings of the character sort of bend and warp the narrative. That brilliant bit at the end, it, th this must make her happier, yes? Oh, I'm really pleased. He says, I'm ugly. Oh, that's good. That's really, really good, because what it means now is I won't have any illusions about him come, coming back to me. Yes, yes, that's very good. And Anne Elliot, you'll know if you've read Persuasion, has a certain strain of self-punishment, which is both painful and yet incredibly familiar, I think, to any adult reading it. And here in that passage, you can hear the drama 
of her own fluctuating feelings, but through Jane Austen's narrative. And it's kind of a miraculous thing that she did, and that nobody had ever done before. And that must in the last sentence. Nobody had ever written that before she came along. Uh, okay. So there's that must there that he talks about in the last sentence. Okay, that's a good example of Jane Austen, free and direct discourse, and uh, we'll end it there.